Welcome everyone to the Success Elevated Podcast. As always, I'm your host Hayden Lee. And this week we have a really special guest. Uh, I spend quite a bit of time with her with uh, Chamber of Commerce stuff, but that's not the hat she's wearing today. Uh, this is Cindy Reese, who is the Idaho Chair of the Employer Support for, for the Garden Reserve. Perfect. ESGR. Yes. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Cindy. Oh, thank you, Hayden. I'm so excited. Yeah, this is going to be cool. I, uh, it's a program that I'm excited to talk about with you for a lot of different reasons. Um, Katie Harris, my boss, is also involved with ESGR. And it's something that we're very proud of. Um, we have a lot of clients that are either veterans or are still in the military, or they employ a lot of people that are veterans or you know it's still in the military. And I think um, what little I know about ESGR, but I'm excited to learn more. What little I know, it just sounds like a really really awesome program. So tell us a little bit about what is ESGR and why it's important. ESGR started back in 1972. Okay. I don't know if you know much about what happened in 1972. Okay. But the draft ended. Yeah. And at that point in time, any of the service members that we had were dropping like flies. We couldn't keep them. And their right. civilian employers were telling them, you have one of two choices. You either work for the military or you work for me. You can't do both. Right. And so at that particular point in time, the Department of Defense chartered an organization called the Employer Support of the Garden Reserve. And in a really quick nutshell, our mission statement is plain and simply to gain and maintain the support of our citizen, soldiers, civilian employers. That's awesome. You, uh, you summed it up really, really nicely there. I, um, Katie had mentioned to me that it was, it was the Department of Defense that was involved and funded it, but I didn't know it was actually their brainchild. So it's something from the very beginning... Um, you know, the United States government has has known there's been a need there right. um, and has wanted to help it out. I mean, 72, um, you know, guys are coming back from Vietnam. It's still, it's it, it in some situations, was still kind of going on. And, yeah. and programs like that, I'm sure, were hugely important. I think back, I mean, you think back to stuff like, uh, you know, just everything that was going on in the world. Like having the opportunity to come home and get a job where your employer was going to support you as a member of the guard, the National Guard, or the Army Reserve, or you know whatever Navy Reserve, Both, right? Um, it's just a great way to you know a great benefit to to individuals that are in the military, but also to their employers. So, do you know one of the really neat things about this organization is that it is all run by volunteers. That's awesome. So every state across the country, we all have a committee in each state, and each one has a chair. Each of us are blessed to have a at least one paid staff gotcha. that helps us with logistical issues. But every single thing that we do in order to help get our message out, all of our outreach events that are done are all done by volunteers. That's really, really cool. What, what are some of the, I guess, like day-to-day, -day, I don't know if there isn't necessarily day-to-day, -day, but like what are you guys working on? on a daily basis or a monthly basis? What are some things that you're working on within ESGR? Well, probably the programs. Yeah. Uh, we have several programs okay. um, that all help us yeah. to get things out. The first thing that we do is our boss lift. And we are actually working on a boss lift as we speak. Okay. It is something that is done annually. And for the last two years, unfortunately, we weren't able to do those. Right, with COVID, yep. Yep, it kind of limited everything that we could do. <laughs> yeah, so limited everything. Yeah. Basically what a boss lift is, I'm just going to, we call it over here locally, um, bosses in booths. Okay. And basically it is a, an event that allows employers in the community to go out and see what their service members are doing every single day that they're gone. As you know, our guardsmen and reservists are gone in the summer for two to three weeks. It used to be pretty much just two weeks and it's a little bit more right now. Yeah. They're also gone one weekend every single month. And a lot of times our employers, especially in the communities that we have here, they don't get the opportunity to see and understand what these people are doing, right. the level of training that they get, and what kind of people come back to them after the training is all done. So. Again, one of the events is the bosses in boots or the boss lift. We get to take you, sometimes we do it locally here and we're working on one here, but we actually get to take people over to Boise to Gowan Field 
90% of the time they get an opportunity to ride in a Black Hawk helicopter, oh, which that's is cool. really fun. <laughs> um, C-130s, KC-135 Chinooks. We've we've had our share of a little bit of everything, and it's it's really kind of a neat experience. That's something I can tell you in a little while. But anyway, um, we take you out. We feed you MREs. <laughs> we let you get really, really dirty. Yeah. Um, you can do weapons qualifications. That's you can cool. play in and on any of the uh, armored equipment that... Uh, we have over in Boise. So it's kind of a really neat event. It's generally a full day, sometimes two days, depending on what we can do. And we're really, really excited this year to get it back up and running again. Gotcha. Would you say like ESGR, the, the, the biggest thing that they do um, is like awareness, like promoting awareness 100%. Of, of like, yeah, reservists and guardsmen or, mm-hmm. you know, guardsmen and women that, mm-hmm. you know, have to spend those weekends once, you know, once a month and those multiple weeks in the summer, just kind of awareness for employees to know, hey, like these people are awesome. They have high quality training. Um, they're great individuals. You should hire them. Kind of is is, is that kind of the, the main gist? Yeah, absolutely. If you have an opportunity, you're getting highly trained, qualified. Um, a lot of times, it's very difficult for some of our membership in the guard to come back and put what they do on the weekend into a resume. Right. How does how does things mix and match and what do they do on that? Um, we offer a lot of different job services and different things that we can do, but it's it's all about awareness. It's right. all about how can we help, what can we do, um, where do the service members go if they have questions? Where do the employers go if they have right. questions? 100% of our program is community outreach and awareness. <laughs> Cindy, this whole thing, you know, as a volunteer, it's something that sounds like you're like super, super passionate about it. Um, I've heard you talk about it on multiple cases. Katie's talked about it on multiple instances. Um, What has made you so passionate about it? How did you first get involved with ESGR? I'm really glad you asked that question. (laughs) Back in 1999. So this has been quite a few years ago. Just just a few years ago. Just a few years ago. Yeah. Both my husband and I had an opportunity as employers in the community to go on a boss lift. And back then, we actually got to go to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Oh, wow. We took a C-130, flew to Fort Knox, spent three days and two nights up at the crack of dawn, 4.30, so it's (laughs) 2.30 here. Right. We got to go to the dining facility, have breakfast with the service members. We were out on, up, and around, in with the weapons. We got to visit with some of the service members. We literally spent three days and two nights living the life of a service member. And it was so incredible to see what they did, how they do it, um, watch them in their training and on their walks and their hikes and doing cadence and yelling and screaming at each other. And <laughs> it was it was an incredible experience to me. Uh, I remember getting over to Boise and getting on the C-130. And there's actually doors on both sides. Okay. And... Aren't can, they crazy loud? Aren't they like when really you're flying? Loud. Yeah, I was gonna and say. And they're they're stinky. They're, <laughs> they smell like hydraulic fluid. And oh that's, yeah, yeah, That's yeah. a story for another time. But anyway, um, we got in, and I can remember it was it was cool outside, and it was foggy, and so there was fog and steam literally rolling through this plane in one side and out the other. Oh wow. It was kind of creepy. It was really <laughs> scary for me for a little while because I had never had any right. experience with it. I didn't know what it was about. Anyway, we got on this plane and we got to go back there and literally live the life of a service member for a while. And we got back into Boise and one of the gentlemen that was in charge of the bus lift came out onto the tarmac and crawled on the bus with us. And he said to us, he said, how many of you had a good time? And of course, every hand went in the air. And, yeah. and he said, how many of you learned a lot? How many of you made new friends? You know, and of course, again, everybody had their their hands up. And he said, how many of you are really, really excited to get home to your family? How many of you have got pets, family members, kids, husbands, wives? 
How many of you are just so excited to get home to your family? And of course, every hand went up. Yeah. You know, you've got pets. You're excited to go back to your life. Drive your car. You know, sleep in until 8 o'clock if that's what you choose to do. <laughs> and not be up running at 5 o'clock in the morning. Eat what you want, how you want, when you want. And he laid it on pretty thick for us. And we all had an opportunity to think about how grateful we were that we were going home. Yeah. And he said to us, the very last question, he, he talked to us for a little bit, and, and then he got a little bit solemn, and, and he said, you know, before you get off this bus today and get back in your vehicles or on planes or go wherever you're going to get back home, he said, I want you to take just one minute, and I want you to think about those people that didn't get to come home. That's my story. Yeah. That's where I started, 1999. I didn't serve in the military. I didn't have the opportunity to serve in the military. I knew I needed to give back, and I wanted to be part of something that was bigger than me, that was bigger than, that was just, that was big. I yeah. wanted to be part. I wanted to give back to my country. I wanted to serve where I could. And so I signed up. <laughs> my husband signed up, and we have both been volunteers since May of 1999. Oh, that's so cool. One of the events um, that we were able to participate in when we were back at Fort Knox, at the time we had a high school daughter. Of course, she's wanting to, she's starting to talk about college a little bit more seriously. And and I said to her, you know, I, I, I'm a bad mom. I didn't save. I didn't put money away. I don't have money for you to go to school. And one of the events when we were at Fort Knox was a briefing by a general and he talked about the army of one and he talked about recruiting and he talked about how they were working and, and, and computers at the time and how technology was changing and how they were trying to recruit the young college kids today to get them involved in the military. And as soon as he was finished with his briefing, um, my husband walked up to him and, and told him that it, he had really enjoyed the, or the, the talk that he had given the briefing. And he said, you know, I'm really interested. He said, I think I need to get an enlistment packet. And this general looked at him and laughed. And he said, sir, I think you're a little bit too old for that. <laughs> so um, he said, no, 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 this isn't for me. This is for my daughter. Oh, and wow. I thought, oh, dear, we're in trouble now. Um, <laughs> she's, she's all girl. Yeah. It would have been a cold day before she ever would have thought about putting on a uniform. We got an enlistment packet. And of course, we took a, you know, an army of one ball cap and, and oh, yeah. brought her some information. That was her souvenir. You know, everybody brings a souvenir to your kids right. after you go on a trip. And so we brought back this souvenir and, and she says, are you crazy? I'm not <laughs> joining the army. Right. Well, that was in 1999. In January of 2001... Well, shortly before that, it would have been probably, I don't know, October, Christmas time somewhere. I don't remember. But um, she knocks on the bedroom door one night and she says, hey, I need to talk to you guys. So she came in and, and sat down on the foot of the bed and she said, you know, I, I really want to go to school. I said, well, that's that's cool. What do you, you know, you can live at home. We'll help you with the vehicle, whatever you need. And she said, it's already taken care of. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, I just joined the Idaho Army National Guard. Wow. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 yeah, no. There's no way. <laughs> and of course, um, you know, at that point in time, we were already invested in it. And now we, we had a dog in the fight, oh, you yeah. know. Um, we had to live it and eat it and drink it. And she gets married and has kids. And, and um, her husband was in the military as well. So on the weekends, we played mom and dad to... Yep three kids and uh, we actually got to see what it was like to 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 live the life of a service member and and the family of a service yeah, member. Yeah, be the family of one as well. So that's kind of that's kind of how I got started in it and once I had the dog in the fight um, we haven't quit. She's actually still in the National Guard. She's got a little over 20 years in now so um, she's doing very well and her kids have her kids have grown up in the life of the military. So that's so cool. And it's fascinating to me. Um, I mean, you got involved two years before 9 11, and really mm -hmm. this whole, the, the, you know, the war on terror and everything that was going on in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Did things change post 
I mean, the world changed post 9-11, but for ESGR, was there different programs that started up after, you know, the, the first waves of the the war on terror? Did things change for you as, as a volunteer or what your what your purpose was with all of that? The only thing that really changed for us and, and for me in particular was the need to make sure that our employers really understood what we were up against. Yeah. You know, and, and still even today, there are so many um, unsure events and consequences yeah. and different things that are happening in our world today. And, and we rely really, really heavily on our military. And so our mission has not changed a bit. Um, COVID slowed us down a little bit. Yeah, we're we're back up and running, and it's more important now than ever to make sure that we provide as many outreach events, as much information as we can, so that these these employers understand what they have. They understand that they actually have an employee, and this is still really hard for me to 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 get sometimes. Um, and, and I've had several employees that are in the guard, but for them to understand that they have a person in their employee that has signed a blank check yeah. for up to and including their life. Yeah. Why would we not support and help those service members in any way and every way possible? Yeah. It's really, really cool. I, um, the reason I asked that question is it, it seemed like, you know, like I said, that the, the world changed, um, you know, 2001, you know, 9-11. <clears throat> uh, it's fascinating to me. And I think it's, it speaks to who you are and, and who, you know, the ESGR is, um, that your, your mindset didn't change. Like that there was this global conflict going on and you guys were going to continue to do your best to help, you know, guardsmen and, and reservists that, that needed help and, and help employers know, hey, you can continue to hire these people and work with them, even though they might get called up tomorrow, right? right? right. Like, you know, like there obviously were multiple instances where National Guards were called up and, and, and had to go. And um, I, I think that's just, that speaks volumes, in, in a nutshell, it speaks volumes to who the ESGR is and who you are, um, that, your, that your mission didn't change, things didn't change for you, that you continued to to do what you were trying to do and, and help people know that um, you know that they can hire these people that they can work with these people and that yeah. there's always opportunities. Do you know I had uh, an opportunity to visit with our adjutant general? Um, it's been a couple of months ago. I don't know, even six maybe or eight months ago, and I was really struck when I visited with him because ESGR we are. We're a hand. We're a family. Our right. our organization here in Idaho, and it is across the country. But we have a really unique, huggy environment. We have a family here of all of our volunteers, and the general and I were speaking just a while back, and we had we were talking about the fact that ESGR had slowed down, and a lot of our volunteers were older and still struggling with what's going on and, and COVID, and they're not as apt to get out and about as much as, as we used to get out. And he said, you know, he said, it's, it's almost sad that it came to that because as soon as COVID hit, the military ramped up, and all of the support that they would have, which would be us, slowed down. Yeah. You know, and, and I felt really bad. You know, I, I didn't really think about the ramifications of what right. it did. They didn't have an opportunity to stop. They didn't have an opportunity to slow down. You know, if there's a fire, they're gone. Yeah. COVID hit, they were asked to help at hospitals and clinic, medical clinics and airports. And it doesn't matter when, you know, when the towers fell. Yeah. It was so volatile back then. And who was the first one to get called? Yeah. The military. Yeah. You know, they don't stop. They, they, they walk head on into whatever they have in front of them. And sometimes I'm not sure that we do the justice to them that we should. Yeah. It seems like such an, uh, yeah, it seems like a no brainer when you, when, mm -hmm. when you, when you explain it like that, that at the drop of a hat, they could be asked to help something, whether it's a, 
a natural disaster and uh, you know a pandemic I, I think a lot of people forget I, I forgot until you just mentioned it that yeah there were several instances where guardsmen were asked to come help um, administer COVID tests right. or what you know whatever right. it might be um, at the drop of a hat they can be asked to go help um, and and do so willingly right. and do so out of the goodness of their hearts um, you, you described it in a great way that they're asked to basically write a blank check. And mm-hmm. at some point, it's going to get asked to cash. To cash. You bet. And uh, why would we not do everything in our power to, to support them? And uh, I think it's what you're doing is great to, for employers to know, hey, you can, you can employ these people. <laughs> Just because they might have to take off once in a while doesn't mean you can't employ them. And they're right. great, hardworking people. Uh, that you know, at, at times, just need a chance. Just need people to you know to right. be willing to take a chance on them. Um, well, I think it's important too that we remember. You know, make mo- make no mistake at all. When these employers have to let their service members go, it's not easy. No, no, no. All never, of the never. employees have to pick up the pieces. Now, I don't know if you're aware of what USERA, what the USERA law is. Yeah, not in detail. No. Okay, USERA law states that when service members go. They have their job back, and it's either yeah. the same or equal to. Um, they qualify for um, any raises, any promotions that would have been um, theirs had they been here. And all of the people in these in these businesses, and, and think about here in Idaho in particular, we are so rural here. Right. And there are a lot of mom and pop, <coughs> you know, one and two. Think about yourself. I mean, if you were... A business owner, right? And you yourself are in the guard, and you only have one other employee, and it's your twenty-year-old son. <laughs> right. You have to go. Yeah. And that twenty-year-old son has to pick up the pieces and do everything he can to keep things running while you're gone. It's it's going to impact you and your family and your lifestyle and what's going on. You know, it's difficult for large companies to help and to make room. For other people to come in and clean up, and then and then put these people back to work again when they come back, yeah. it's it's a difficult task, and so you know I think especially here in Idaho, it's 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 been tough. But I'll tell you what, I have never in my life met so many patriots. Yeah, you know in the in the twenty plus years that I've served, there are so many employers um, that have lost two or three or four of their employees at one time. And people just seem to be, they're so patriotic and, and they, they operate with their heart. They pick up the pieces. They make stuff happen. We have got some amazing employers right here in our community yeah. that um, we've given awards to. That's another program that, yeah. that we have is our awards program. And service members can actually nominate their employer for a patriotic employer award. That's cool. And it's really cool because we get to go um, present these awards to the employer. Sometimes the employee is there in uniform. Sometimes they're deployed. And yeah. we get to go present this award on behalf of that service member and let these employers know how much they're appreciated and 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 the value that they add to these people's lives. So that's another one of our programs. And it's just, it's so much fun and it's so rewarding. No, that's that's really, really cool. I. Yeah, I mean, we've got to highlight those that are willing to to really support, uh, you know, these reservists and these guardsmen. I, I I think you're right. There's there's employers that we've got to we've got to recognize, right? Um, because they're so willing to to offer jobs and employment to these people that are that are giving up part of their lives, right? You know, you know, and I think too um, clear back when I oh wow clear back in '99, yeah. Um, I actually was working with and for Tad Jenkins. And at the time, he had a, an RV dealership in Idaho Falls. And I let him know that I was involved in this and that if my involvement with the ESGR was going to create any conflict or problems, I, I wouldn't stay employed. I'd go find something else. And I was totally okay with that. And at the time, and, and mind you, this is clear back in 99, 2000, 2001. Right. His words to me at that point in time were, my contribution is your time. So if there's stuff that you need to do for the ESGR, I'm 100% behind you. And so here we are 20 years later, and I'm 
still with him. Yeah. And that's his contribution. You know, I'm that's not cool. doc time. How many of our volunteers have got incredibly supportive um, employers and families and spouses? You know, it, yeah. it doesn't take a lot of our time, but sometimes it takes a little bit of time and we can't do it without our employer, without um, our families. Yeah, that's so, so cool. I, yeah, I, yeah. You've, you've just hit on some really, really awesome things and... And I think it's uh, it's a testament to who you are and who the ESGR are is that, uh, I mean, your guys are just willing to help those that uh, need a little bit of support and mm-hmm. uh, recognize the employers that are willing to help support uh, those people as well. Um, you, you've hit on, like, you've kind of hinted at it a few times as we've talked here, but what is the, uh, what's the future look like for ESGR? What are you hoping for the future? Um, I know you're obviously heavily involved here in, in the Idaho chapter, if you will, of ESGR, but um, what does the future look like? The future is not ever going to change. Yeah. The ESGR is the ESGR. We are dedicated. We are committed. We want to make sure that our service members have the, the support that they need, that their families have the support that they need. We need to make sure, probably above all, that our numbers within our committee are strong. Yeah. Again, we don't live in a world that we lived in back in 1999 and in 2000. Things have changed drastically. And I think the more active the world is in different situations, the more volunteers we are going to need to help make sure that there are smooth transitions into and out of um, call-ups, deployments, I think um, families need us. I don't. I don't really see it changing. Yeah. You know, in the 20, 20 plus years I've been involved, our mission is still the same, and that's to gain and maintain the support of our citizen soldiers, employers, and so I, I don't. I don't really see it changing. Um, you know, it may slow down again. COVID, COVID zapped us really hard for a while. Yeah. We've got we've got some resilience. We've got some great people. I think it's more important today than it was even back then is to make sure that our community knows that our service members are there and what they need to help take care of us. Oh, that's so cool. Mission, uh, the world changes, but your, but your mission stays the same. Mm-hmm. It's, that's really, really awesome. What can, uh, what can people do? The, we, we don't have a huge audience, but we do have uh, people that like to listen to the podcast. Um, what can people do to help support what you guys are doing? There is not a day go by that we're not looking for volunteers. We need volunteers. Awesome. Um, We've got a great committee all over the state. I'm not just talking about Southeast Idaho. We've got our state is divided up into five areas. I've got two areas up in northern Idaho, and I've got great leadership up there, and they've got a small, very small group of volunteers up there. So, um, you know, if you do have any followers that are in, in northern Idaho that are at all interested in, in having one of the most incredible experiences of their entire life, yeah. we would love to visit with them. Um, northern Idaho has two. We have the Boise Valley is, has an area. Twin Falls area has an area. And southeast Idaho has an area. Cool. So I have chairs in each one of these areas. We have different events and activities that go on in each of the areas. Again, all of our activities are all the same. We all do the same thing. We all have the same goal in mind. We just do it in different areas of the state. When we can, when we can get everybody together, uh, we try to do our, our big deal in Boise. And um, we invite all of our folks from all over the state for that. But um, we're looking for volunteers and, and you know, if... When I talked to to Katie about this, you know, one of the things that we talked about was what it's like to to grow in her business and to grow fast and to be part of something bigger than yourself. And it's one thing to be part of something bigger in your professional life, but it's something entirely different when, when it's giving. Yeah. It's, it's about the giving and the helping and being part of that and being part of with so many people that have the same thoughts and the same goals and the same dreams. It's, it's beyond anything that I could have ever experienced. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I, I, I think, uh, 
I think what you're doing is is fantastic, Cindy. It's it's really really cool. It's for for someone that's outside looking in that um, is just now learning about programs like this. I think it's really really cool what you guys are doing, and and I hope yeah, I hope anybody that's listening uh, can reach out and and volunteer. And there's not only is there an Idaho chapter, which is where we're we're at. There's right. chapters all over the country. And, Every uh, state. Find find an opportunity to volunteer and and work with your local ESGR to to help recognize employers that are employing guardsmen and, and reservists and just ultimately it's going to help uh you know people that are serving the military right. and uh that's that's the goal so where can people find you cindy where can people find out more about uh, stuff like this esgr.mil okay any you can get on there you can click on the idaho state and on that website it will give you um our hierarchy. It will give you the people that you need to get in touch with. There's all kinds of information on there. Okay. And um, they'll put, if you get in there, they'll put you in touch with anybody here in the state locally. Fantastic. Cindy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been, it's been awesome to hear you talk about this. I love hearing how passionate you are about it. Uh, your, your story, your personal story, your family story is, is really, really cool. And, and uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for letting me. Yeah, I appreciate it. We'll talk to you later. Hey, thanks. This has been Success Elevated, making you a little bit better one show at a time. Thanks for joining us. Subscribe on any major podcast platform or check out our website at successonpoint.com.